Good morning, guys. I'm going to show you how I'm going to access uh, Out of My Mind chapters three and four from our website. So right now I'm on the Google Classroom feed and I'm going to click on our website right here and that will open this home page. And then right across the top, we'll see the read aloud button. So I'll click there. Now here, something that will be new is our read aloud from yesterday will be right here, chapters one and two. And then today we're doing chapters three and four. So I'll open the out of my mind PDF, which is the online book. That's the first button. The second button right here is the Padlet where you guys are adding your thoughts to after you listen to the read aloud. So today we're on chapters three and four. Just like we saw in yesterday's video, um, the table of contents is hyperlinked. So if I click chapter three right here, it will take me to exactly where we need to go. Chapter three. I guess I figured out I was different a little at a time. Since I never had trouble thinking or remembering, it actually sort of surprised me that I couldn't do stuff and it made me angry. My father brought home a small stuffed cat for me when I was really little, less than a year old, I'm sure. It was white and soft and just the right size for chubby baby fingers to pick up. I was sitting in one of those baby carriers on the floor, strapped in and safe as I checked out my world of green shag carpet and matching sofa. Mom placed the toy cat in my hands and I smiled. Here, Melody, Daddy brought you a play pretty. She cooed in that high-pitched voice that adults use with children. Now, what's a play pretty? As if it's not hard enough figuring out real stuff, I have to figure out the meanings of made up words. But I love the soft coolness of the cat's fur. Then it fell on the floor. Dad placed it in my hands the second time. I really wanted to hold it and hug it, but it fell on the floor once more. I remember I got mad and started to cry. Try again, sweetie, Dad said, sadness decorating the edges of his words. You can do it. My parents placed the cat in my hands again and again, but every single time my little fingers could not hold it and it tumbled back down to the carpet. I did my own share of tumbling onto that rug. I guess that's why I remember it so well. It was green and ugly when you looked at it up close. I think shag carpeting was outdated even before I was born. I had lots of chances to figure out how the threads of a rug are woven and I lay there waiting for someone to pick me up. I couldn't roll over, so I was just an irritated me, the shag rug, and the smell of spilled sour soy milk in the face, in my face until I got rescued. My parents would prop me up on the floor with pillows on either side of me when I wasn't in the baby seat, but I'd see a sunbeam coming through the window, turn my head to watch the little dust things that floated in, in it, and bam, I'd be face first on the floor. I'd shriek, one of them would pick me up, quiet me and try to balance me better with, within the cushions. Still, I'd fall again a few times. It fell again in a few minutes. But then dad would do something funny, like try to jump like the frog we were watching on Sesame Street, and it would make me giggle, and I'd fall over again. I didn't want to fall or even mean to. I couldn't help it. I had no balance at all, none. I don't understand. I didn't understand at the time, but my father did. He would sigh and pull me up onto his lap, He'd hug me close and hold me hold up the little cat or whatever toy I seemed to be interested in so I could touch it. Even though he sometimes made his own vocabulary, dad never spoke baby talk to me like my mother did. He always spoke to me as if he were talking to a grown up, using real words and assuming I would understand him. He was right. Your life is not going to be easy, little Melody, he'd say quietly. If I could switch places with you, I'd do it in a heartbeat. You know that, don't you? I just blinked but I got what he meant. Sometimes his face would be wet with tears. He'd take me outside at night and whisper in my ear about the stars and the moon and the night wind. The stars are up there putting on a show just for you, kid, he'd say. Look at that amazing display of sparkle and feel that wind. It's trying to tickle your toes. And during the day, he would sometimes take off all the blankets that my mother insisted I be wrapped in and let me feel the warmth of the sun on my face and legs. He had placed a bird feeder on our porch and we would sit there together as the birds started in, picking up seeds one at a time. The red one is a cardinal, he'd tell me. That one never. That one there is a blue jay. They don't like each other much, and he'd chuckle. What Dad did most was sing to me. He had a clear voice that seemed made for songs like Yesterday and I Want to Hold Your Hand. Dad loves the Beatles. There's no figuring out what parents 
figuring out parents and why they like stuff. I've always had a very good, they had very good hearing. I remember listening to the sound of my father's car as he drove up our street, pulled into the driveway and rustled into his pockets to find his house keys. He tossed them on the bottom step. Then I'd hear the sound of the refrigerator door open twice. The first time he'd get something cold to drink. The second time he'd search for a huge hunk of monster cheese. Dad loved cheese. It doesn't agree with his digestive system very well though. Dad always has the loudest, stinkiest farts in creation. I don't know how he manages to control them at work, or even if he does, but when he'd get home, he'd let them loose. They'd start as he'd walk up the stairs, step, fart, step, fart, step, fart. I'd be laughing by the time he got to my room, and he'd lean over my bed and kiss me. His breath always smelled like peppermints. When he could, Dad read to me, even though I knew he had to be tired. He'd smile, pick up, pick up a book or two, and I'd get to go and get to go to where the wild things are or where the cat in the hat was making a mess. I probably knew the words by heart before he did. Good night, moon, wake, make way for ducklings, dozens more. The words to every single book my father ever read to me are forever tucked inside. Here's the thing. I'm ridiculously smart, and I'm pretty sure I have a photographic memory. It's like I have a camera in my head. And if I see or hear something, I click it and it stays. I saw a special on PBS once on children who were geniuses. These kids could remember complicated strands of numbers and recall words and pictures in correct sequence and quote long passages of poetry. So can I. I remember the toll free number for every infomercial and the mailing address and websites too. If I ever need a new set of knives or the perfect exercise machine, I've got that information on file. I know the names of actors and actresses, all of the shows, what time each program comes on, which channel, and which shows are repeats. I even remember the dialogue from each show and the commercials in between. Sometimes I wish I had a delete button in my head. I have a television remote control clicker attached to my wheelchair, very close to my right hand. On the left side, I have a remote for the radio. I have enough control in my fist and thumbs to push the buttons so I can change the station, and I'm really glad of that. 24 hours of big time wrestling or the home shopping station can drive a person nuts. I can adjust the volume and even play DVDs if someone has popped one in the player for me. Lots of times I watch dad's old videos of me. But I also like the cable channels that talk about stuff like kings and the kingdoms they conquered or doctors and the diseases they cured. I've seen specials on volcanoes, shark attacks, dogs born with two heads, and the mummies of Egypt. I remember them all, word for word. Not that it does me a lot of good. Nobody knows it's there but me, not even my mother, although she has this mom sense that knows I understand stuff. But even that has its limits. Nobody gets it. Nobody. It drives me crazy. So every once in a while, I really lose control. I mean, really. My arms and legs get all tight and lash out like tree limbs in a storm. Even my face draws up. I sometimes can't breathe real well when this happens, but I have to because I need to screech and scream and jerk. They're not seizures. Those are medical and make you go to sleep. These things, I call them my tornado explosions, are pieces of me. All the stuff that does not work gets balled up and hyped up. I can't stop, even though I want to, to, even though I know I'm freaking people out. I lose myself. It can get kind of ugly. Once, when I was about four, mom and I were in one of those superstores that sells everything from milk to sofas. I was still small enough to fit in the child seat in the front of the cart. Mom always came prepared and stuffed pillows on each side of me so I wouldn't tilt. Everything was fine. She tossed toilet paper and mouthwash and detergent into the cart, and I looked around, enjoying the ride. Then, in the toy section, I saw them. Brightly colored packages of plastic blocks. Just that morning, I had seen a warning on television about that toy. They were being recalled because the blocks had been painted with lead paint. Several children had already been hospitalized with lead poisoning, the report had said. But there they were, still on the shelf. I pointed to them. Mom said, no, sweetie, you don't need those. You have enough toys. I pointed again and screamed and kicked my feet. No, Mom said more forcefully. You are not going to have a tantrum on me. I didn't want the blocks. I wanted to tell her they were dangerous. I wanted her to tell somebody to get rid of them before a child got sick. But all I could do was scream and point and kick. So I did. I got louder. Mom rushed out of the toy section, pushing the cart real fast. Stop it, she cried out at me. I couldn't. It made me so angry that I couldn't tell her. 
The tornado took over. My arms became fighting sticks. My legs became weapons. I kicked at her with my feet. I screamed. I kept pointing in the direction of those blocks. People stared. Some pointed. Others looked away. Mom got to the door of the store, yanked me out of the cart, and left it with all her selections sitting there. She was almost in tears when she got to the car as she buckled me in my seat. She almost screamed at me. What is wrong with you? Well, she knew the answer to that one, but she knew that it was not my usual behavior. I gulped, sniffed, and finally calmed down. I hoped the people at the store watched the news. When we got home, she called the doctor and told him about my crazy behavior. He sent a prescription for a sedative, but mom didn't give it to me. The crisis was over by then. I don't think mom ever figured out what I was trying to say that day. Chapter four, doctors. Where do I start? Doctors really don't get me. Mom's a nurse, so I guess she speaks their language, but they sure don't know how to talk to me. I've seen dozens of doctors in my life who all try to analyze me and figure me out. None of them can fix me, so I usually ignore them and act like a retarded person they think I am. I paste on a blank look, focus on one wall, and pretend their questions are too hard for me to understand. It's sort of what they expect anyway. When I turned five, it was time to think about enrolling me in school, so my mother took me to a doctor whose job it was to figure out how smart I was. She wheeled me in, locked the brake so my wheelchair would not roll, and made sure the lap strap was fastened. When my seatbelt comes undone, and it does every once in a while, I slide out of that wheelchair like a wet piece of spaghetti. The specialist was a very large man. The bottom button of his shirt had come undone and his stomach poked through above his belt. Gross. His name's Dr. Hugely. He, my name's Dr. Hugely, he said in a booming voice. For real, I couldn't make this stuff up. We're going to play a game today, okay? I'll ask you some questions and you get to play with the toys here. Won't that be fun? I knew it would be a long, long hour. He brought out a stack of well-used, hopefully not lead-tainted wood blocks that leaned, then leaned in so close to me, I could see the pores in his face. Gross. Can you stack these in order according to size? He said loudly and slowly, as if I was hard of hearing and really stupid. But who was being stupid? Didn't he know I couldn't grab the blocks? Of course I knew which block was bigger than the other but I couldn't stack them if he paid me money. So I just took my arm and swept them all to the floor. They fell with a wooden clatter. I tried not to laugh as he picked them up. He breathed really hard and reached for them. Next, he held up a glossy eight by 10 card with different color painted on each one. Tell me when you see the color blue, Melody, he said in that voice that told me he thought this was all a waste of his time. When the blue card showed up, I pointed to it and made a noise. Ugh, I said, marvelous. Tremendous, stupendous, he shouted. He praised me like I had just passed the test to get into college. If I could roll my eyes, I would have. Then he showed me green, so I kicked and made a noise, but my mouth can't make the G sound. The doctor looked disappointed. He scribbled something on his clipboard, pulled out another stack of cards, then said loudly, I'm going to ask you some questions now, Melody. These might be hard, but do your best, okay? I just looked at him and waited while he placed the cards, the first set of cards in front of me. Number one, which one of these is not like the others? Did he get the stuff from Sesame Street? He showed me pictures of a tomato, a cherry, a round red balloon, and a banana. I know he was probably looking for the balloon as the answer, but that just seemed too easy. So I pointed to the banana because the first three were round and red and the banana was not. Dr. Hugely sighed and scribbled more notes. Number two, he said, he showed me four more cards. This time there were pictures of a cow, a whale, a camel, and an elephant. Which animal gives birth to a calf? Now, I watch Animal Planet all the time. I know for a fact that all the animals he had pictures there had babies called a calf. I thought doctors were supposed to be smart. What to do? I hit each picture very slowly and carefully, then did it once more just to make sure he understood. I don't think he did. I heard him mumble, cow, as he wrote more notes. It was clear he was giving up on me. I noticed a copy of Goodnight Moon on his bookshelf. I think it was written in Spanish. It was called Buenas Noches Luna. That would have been a fun, fun to look at, but I had no way of telling him that I'd like to see the book. After watching Sesame Street and Dora the Explorer a million times and sitting for hours watching the Spanish channels, I could understand quite a bit of Spanish if it was spoken slowly enough and at least enough words to read the title of that book. He never thought to ask me about that, of course. 
I knew the words and melodies of hundreds of songs, a symphony exploding inside my head with no one to hear it but me. But he never asked me about my music. I knew all the colors and shapes and animals that children my age were supposed to know, plus lots more. In my head, I can count to 1,000, forward and backward. I could identify hundreds of words on sight, but all of that was stuck inside. Dr. Hugely, even though he had been to college for like a million years, would never be smart enough to see inside of me. So I put on my handicapped face and took my mind back to last summer when mom and I went to the zoo. I really liked the elephants, but talk about stink. Actually, Dr. Hugely sort of reminded me of, what, of one of them. My mom and the doctor had no idea why I was smiling as we rolled into the waiting room while he wrote up his evaluation of me. It didn't take long. I'm always amazed, I'm always amazed at how adults assume I can't hear. They talk about me as if I'm invisible figuring I'm too retarded to understand their conversation. I learned quite a bit this way, but this conversation was really awful. He didn't even try to soften the news for my mom, who I'm sure felt like she got hit by a truck. He began by clearing his throat. <clears throat> Mrs. Brooks, he then said, it is my opinion that Melody is severely brain damaged and profoundly retarded. Whoa, even though I was only five, I had watched enough Easter Seals telethons to know that this was really bad really bad. I felt a thud in my gut. My mom gasped, then said nothing for a full minute. Finally, she took a deep breath and protested quietly. But I know she's bright. I can see it in her eyes. You love her. It's only normal to have wishful thinking, Dr. Hugely told her gently. No, she has a spark. More than that, a flame of real intelligence. I just know it, my mother insisted, sounding a little stronger. It takes time to accept the limitations of a beloved child. She has cerebral palsy, Miss Brooks. I know the name of her condition, doctor, my mother said with ice in her voice, but a person is so much more than the name of a diagnosis on a chart. Good try, mom, I was thinking, but already her voice was losing its edge, melting into the mushiness of helplessness. She laughs at jokes, my mother told him, the ice in her voice replaced by desperation, right at the punchline. My mom's voice faded. What she was saying sounded ridiculous, even to me, but I could see she just couldn't find the words to explain her, her gut feeling that I had some smarts in, in here. Dr. Hugely looked from her to me. He shook his head, then said, you're lucky she has the ability to smile and laugh, but Melody will never be able to walk on her own or speak a single sentence. She will never be able to feed herself, take care of her own personal needs, or understand anything more than simple instructions. Once you accept that reality, you can deal with the future. That was just plain mean. My mom hardly ever cries, but she did that day. She cried and cried and cried. Dr. Hugely had to give her a whole box of tissues. Both of them ignored me while she sobbed, and he tried to find nice words to say to make her feel better. He didn't do a very good job. Finally, he gave her options. You and your husband have several decisions to make, he told my mom. You can choose to keep her at home, or you can send her to a special school for the developmentally disabled. There aren't many choices here locally. Where do they get those almost pleasant sounding phrases to describe kids like me. Mom made it sound like they could have been mewing a kitten, could have been the mewing of a kitten. He was losing. Dr. Hugely continued. You can also decide to put Melody in a residential facility where she can be cared for and kept comfortable. He pulled out a colorful brochure with a smiling child in a wheelchair on the cover and handed it to mom. I trembled as she took it. Let's see, the doctor said. Melody is uh, five now. That's the perfect age for her to learn to adjust to a new environment. You and your husband can get on with your lives without her as a burden. In time, her memories of you will fade. I stared at mom frantically. I didn't want to be sent away. Was I a burden? I never thought about it like that. Maybe it would be easier for them if I weren't around. I gulped. My hands got cold. Mom wasn't looking at me. She was staring daggers at Dr. Hugely. She crumpled up the tissue and she held and stood up. Let me tell you something, doctor. There is no way in heaven or heck that we will be sending Melody away to a nursing home. I blinked. Was this my mother? I blinked again, and she was still there, right up in Dr. Hugely's face. She wasn't finished. You know what? My mother said as she angrily hurled the brochure into the trash can. I think you're cold and insensitive, and I hope you have a, never have a child with disabilities. You'd probably put it out with your trash. Dr. Hugely looked shocked. And what's more, she continued, I think you're wrong. I know you are. 
Melody has more brains hidden in her head than you'll ever have, despite those fancy degrees from fancy schools you've got posted all over your walls. It was the doctor's turn to blink. You've got it easy. You have all your physical functions working properly. You never have to struggle just to be understood. You think you're smart because you have a medical degree? He was wise enough to keep his mouth shut and ashamed enough to lower his head. Mom was on a roll. You're not so intelligent, sir. You're just lucky. All of us who have all of our faculties intact are just plain blessed. Melody is able to figure out things, communicate and manage in a world where nothing works right for her. She's the one with true intelligence. She marched out of his office then, rolling me swiftly through the thick doors. In the hall, we did a quick fist bump. Well, the best I could manage. My hands were no longer cold. I'm taking you right now and enrolling you at Spalding Street Elementary School, she announced with determination as we headed back to the car. Let's get busy.